I'd started smoking when I was 11. I was in grade six at Cathedral College in East Melbourne. And I went to my grandmother's because she lived literally 200 metres from my school. And I went there after school on a Friday. And I said, oh, Nan, I'd be, I've had a cigarette. And she just said, what was it like? I said, oh, it was good. She goes, oh, can you go down to Smith Street and give me a packet of Park Drive and I'll split them with you. So <laughs> I bought my first packet of cigarettes and went Harvey's with my Nan. That's Tony Birch, novelist, poet, short story writer, childhood smoker. So I had 10 cigarettes in the Park Drive pack. She took us out and put them in a cigarette case and I smoked about half of them before I got home. And <laughs> I still remember my mother going crazy, where did you get those cigarettes? And I said, off oh, Nan. <laughs> so, oh, you grassed her up. Yeah, you just hung her out to dry. <laughs> straight away, yeah. There's a question I love to ask writers I know. Beyond their own words and the sentences that made a living crafting, what are the bits of advice, the quotes, the inescapable earworms that clang around in their head? The reason I love this question is because I always end up learning something surprising about how and why writers tell stories and about the people who've shaped their work. I call this game Life Sentences. Today, I've asked Tony Birch to play. From Schwartz Media, I'm Michael Williams. This is Read This, a show about the books we love and the stories behind them. Tony Birch, what's your life sentence? Well, one of my primary life sentences is a line given to me by my grandmother, which was, wish in one hand, spit in the other. And there is a second half to that, which was rarely delivered. It didn't have to be which was then, and let's see which one fills up first. She didn't believe in making a wish and and determining your life through luck. She basically thought if there was any luck in our family, it was only bad luck, so that would be a waste of time. Were you close to your grandmother as a kid? Oh, extremely close. Um, We lived next door to each other, so I was born in Carlton, and we had two houses in Carlton immediately next door to each other, so... I lived close to my grandmother and then we moved over the next few years and she often again would move with us and live next door or or move in with us. So that, um, yeah, we were very, very close emotionally and and physically. I love that despite moving about a bit, she was a package deal and was happy to kind of up sticks and move with you every time. And whichever dog she happened to have at the time, she always had dogs. So um, when she came, um, the dogs came with her. In fact... My grandmother was um, arrested once for drunkenness in Fitzroy and um, she said, I can't come with you because I have my dog. She had her two um, dogs with her and the police said, that's okay, we'll lock them up as well. So um, they locked the two dogs up and they spent the night with my grandmother in the Fitzroy cells. Was she an imposing figure? In some ways. I mean, she was very loving, so I I never felt um, intimidated by her at all. Um, She was a small woman physically. But she was a very determined woman and, um, yeah, she could be very ferocious but more in the defence of her family rather than, say, any dispute in the family. So I loved being in her company. I loved going to her house. When we moved to the um, commission flats in Richmond and she was still in Fitzroy at one stage, I had the joy of spending every Monday night at her house on my own. Yeah, when you're a 10 and 11-year-old boy, sometimes it's difficult to have a conversation with someone who's two generations older, but we we got on really well. And um, no, I, I always felt very, very loving being around her. Tony's nan was a huge presence in his childhood. And if you open any of his books, you'll find her presence there too. Tony's work has been well populated with strong, loving women ever since his debut novel, Shadow Boxing. Since then, he's written eight books, he's an inexhaustible teacher, mentor and support for other writers, and he's always got several projects on the go at any given time. His current work in progress, a novel called Women and Children, picks up on his favourite themes, family bonds, damage and repair, trust and uncompromising love in the face of hardship. And if anyone taught him about that, it's his nan, Alma, who never believed in luck. But... She did have this very 
strong sense of what we would call of spirituality. So that when I was alone with her, she would speak of seeing spirits when she was a child in Tasmania, but wouldn't allude to the context of that. And I'm sure that she was really talking about lost siblings, her mother, probably you know, grandparents, Aboriginal people. But she would often talk about having seen spirits and ghosts. And to the point where if you're sitting and having tea in the kitchen, you would get, say, let's say the light shade, I remember vibrating, she would say, there's someone here. And I used to say, oh, then it's the back doors open and it's just the wind and the breeze. She wouldn't have it at all. So, so she was both very practical and pragmatic, but also wondrous in that, in that way as well. When we lived in Atherton Street, we lived at 56 and she lived at 54 and there was a peach tree and I noticed that there was a particular branch on her side of the tree hanging over her lean-to kitchen that was full of very ripe peaches. So I just climbed up beside the fence, climbed onto the roof with the intention of picking um, some fruit and my nan was in her kitchen having breakfast and I just didn't look and I, I fell through a skylight which was above the kitchen table and it was, yeah, that wired glass. So my whole body didn't fall through but my complete leg was hanging from her ceiling and initially she thought I was a burglar so she's pulling on my <laughs> leg and I was screaming, Nan, don't. And it was quite delicate to get my leg out of the, the glass but the, the result was I had a really deep cut on my leg my mum wasn't home, so she had to take me to St Vincent's Hospital. I couldn't walk. So she put me in a, a baby's pram or pusher. So I looked like a giant baby <laughs> going up the street. But what was interesting about that story is that she didn't feel openly sympathetic, oh, you poor bugger. You, you, you felt that she wouldn't give you um, undue sympathy, but she wasn't a person to criticise. Either. She would say, OK, we'll get on and, and get this fixed. While his mum worked late, Alma would look after him. They'd go treasure hunting, searching the local op shops, where she'd buy crockery and curios for herself and treats for him. One comic, one toy and one woolen jumper, he remembers, blaming this practice for what he now identifies as a lifelong fetish for nice jumpers. Something that I loved and all of the cousins loved, so there are many, many of us, was that my grandmother had what she called a cocktail cabinet in the front room a beautiful Art Deco cabinet, and it was full of um, objects, trinkets that she'd collected from op shops over the years. And the cabinet was locked and she had the key. And you weren't allowed to take any of the objects out of the cabinet, but you, we would sit there um, looking at them. And she would always say, if we did want to take one of the objects out, which you know, could be an ashtray, a decorated ashtray, um, a model of a horse, I remember a ceramic horse, she would say, no, they're for show. Something that was for show rather than use was important to her. And she also had a magnificent ocean liner model, scale model of an ocean liner that a guy had made in Pentridge Prison. He once came to my grandmother's to um, buy some beer because he ran a sly grog um, from the back gate for many years and he didn't have any money and she gave him a couple bottles of beer and then he came back the next day with this beautiful scale model of this boat. And you could open doors and lift up manholes and you'd see a little model toilet um, to scale inside. So those objects that she kept in the house were really uh, dear to us. She taught me something that stayed with me or started to influence me as a writer. When she bought an object, she would justify it on the basis of a story that it had, even though, of course, she didn't know what that story was. And she would have a bowl and she'd say something like, I imagine the people that must have you know, enjoyed this. Imagine the woman who would have filled this up with beetroot. And then, of course, when she passed the object on, which she sometimes did, she would talk about what she had used it for. So the object had a story also. 
So given that she was such a storyteller, how did she talk to you as a kid about her life? Like, how did you understand how she'd come to where she was, who she was, what she'd experienced when you were a kid? Well, my grandmother in some ways, even though we were close and had a fairly open relationship, she was also quite secretive and in some ways quite mysterious. She had a a tattoo of a broken heart on her shoulder that she would never speak about how or why she got it or when she got it. Certainly she got it as quite a young person and she used to wear a bandage over it. Um, She was a little bit embarrassed by it, but of course we in the family knew it was there. Even as a kid, Tony knew there were things his nan wasn't telling him, but there was a lot she didn't shield him from. Grief, for example, was something that was shared. My grandmother, um, her husband, my grandfather, who I never met, committed suicide when my mother was, I think, 12 or 13 years of age in very horrific um, circumstances, uh, very traumatic circumstances. When I was six years of age, my youngest uncle, so my grandmother's youngest son at the time, he was living with us in Fitzroy. He'd just been released from prison and he was murdered. He was shot dead outside the Rainbow Hotel in Fitzroy. And I remember the night of that information being brought home to the family and just the screaming of both my grandmother and mother of sort of both rage and, and, and fear. The sheer unthinkable trauma of these memories and of the other losses Tony watched Alma have to process over the years gave Tony a framework for how to grieve. There is a brutal openness and honesty which encompasses everything. So yes, grief and loss are always spoken about and we know that suicide is something that people often cannot speak of. There's often shame around suicide. There's a lot of guilt around suicide, I think, in families. I was always aware of how my grandfather had died. So in a way, you may think also that, you know, again, in today's climate of what we talk and don't talk about, I was exposed to conversations which would probably seem to be quite inappropriate in that sense, but I I don't feel anything but gratitude for that. I feel that it it's really helped me understand my family, but also helped me understand myself. His grandmother's mantra, a wish in one hand and spit in the other, shows a determination not to dwell on arbitrary, unhelpful questions of luck and hope. But it's not about giving up either. I think the complexity of what you might call her philosophy was that you didn't ignore anything, you didn't forget anything, but you didn't let it burden with you and you can't wish it away or you can't wish for change. If you wish something to happen, it's not being responsible. It's actually almost like saying, let this be done by luck. Whereas our approach is, if something's going to change, it's because we have to make it change and work hard to make it change. Tony's nan didn't dwell on the past, but she did carry it with her. Coming up after the break, the childhood Alma wouldn't speak about the links between her secrets and broader historical silences, and what it all means for the author and historian Tony Birch has become. Welcome back. Tony Birch has made a career out of vivid depictions of children trying to make sense of the world. Kids in a birch book are rarely allowed innocence, but often have to endure silences and absences and bear witness to adult ruin. In his novels Blood or Ghost River and across his short fiction, he's a master of sketching out that intersection between knowing and not knowing. While the constant presence of his nan in his childhood and adolescent years was a source of great love, it was only as he grew older that the tenor of her stories and what he understood them to mean began to change. My grandmother was born in Tasmania, around Bridport. She was taken from her Aboriginal mother when she was at about 18 months old, and she was given to a local publican. And when I say given, what I mean by that, she wasn't legally adopted. There was no reason that we know of that she was taken from her mother, and she stayed with those people until she was about 15 years of age. Then what she did was she ran away and she caught a boat to Melbourne 
and she married quite young here in Melbourne. And why I say she was mysterious is that she had about six aliases, as in surnames. Now, a couple of those were to men she'd married, but she had several other names that she claimed was her, her family name. One of them was Bordeaux, um, which she said she had you know, French heritage, but as it turned out, that was a name that she got off the front of a wine bottle. Another was McEwen, which she was very fond of because she said she was a cousin to Black Jack McEwen, who was Prime Minister of Australia for about a week after Harold Holt vanished. And she had a lot of stories, very fictional stories, but I think clearly why she did that was to protect herself. She probably, I think as a girl, had lived in great fear. And when she escaped that family that she'd been given to, she clearly didn't want to be found. So I think the reason that she, she told these fantastical stories about herself were to deflect any sense of who she really was. I mean, it's not surprising because there's, when you imagine the idea of secrecy, there is secrecy in many ways. And certainly in regard to a family who had taken a child illegally, there would be great secrecy around that. So how they presented her as a child and where she sat in their family, they told many different versions of that story also. So it's a story that will always have holes in it or a jigsaw puzzle with pieces that will never be found. And as much as we've been able to put her life together, we can't do that fully and never will. And I suppose that's why she filled those gaps with so many fictional elements. Rather than not know the story, she just thought she'd add to it. You, as well as being an accomplished writer of fiction, are a practising historian and have worked as a historian. And that relationship between unearthing stories and telling stories has been kind of central to your professional life. Yeah, and I suppose the thing that... It, it, it's why I don't like national histories. I think that... They try to be a bedrock and, and that's not possible. So what I would say is a trained historian who did a PhD in history and loves doing archival work, loves doing evidentiary history, is that there is no such thing as a history that is rock solid. There is no such thing as a factual history. I'm not being a relativist here, a postmodernist, God forbid, but saying that all history, all accounts, all stories, be they written or unwritten, are suspect. You've got to look at history as being in some ways a suspect discipline and welcome that, not be anxious about that, so that none of our stories are completely factual. No one has a factual life story. In an interview he gave back in 2020, Tony reflected on the role of stories in a country riven by colonial silences. He said, I've never met an Aboriginal person who doesn't have a story of that sort of loss through the stolen generations somewhere in their family. No Aboriginal person I know is completely intact because of that. Everyone is missing someone, and someone in that family has got to carry that repository of memory. Talking to him, it's clear that Tony, the writer, and the grandson, learnt much of that at Alma's side. I have a story of my grandmother I love to tell. She was in the last weeks of her life. She was in St Vincent's Hospital in Fitzroy, which I think is a great place to be because I'd spent so many occasions there in casualty as a kid getting stitched up and a lot of broken bones all through accidents. So my nan is in the 10th floor of the new building. I'm sitting in a windowsill, like a child again, like I'm sitting on this very wide window in the sun looking over Fitzroy again, which is just so apt. And she had almost lost consciousness. And then she woke up and I went up to the bed And I asked her what she wanted, and she was struggling to speak. And she said, when I die, can you go to St. Francis Church and light a candle? Which surprised me, because I'd never known my nan to go into a church. And I said, when should I do that? And she immediately got annoyed and said, I don't know, I'll be dead. Do it when you feel like it. And (laughs) sort of lost consciousness again. And I forgot about it. And then about three months later, I was in the city doing Christmas shopping and I was, came out of Maya and, you know, across from St. Francis and I just thought, oh, I'll go and light a candle for it. Yeah, I'm more lapsed religiously than Richard Dawkins, you know. So um, I went over to the church and I went in 
And I'd been an altar boy as a kid and you know, we, we went to Catholic church, all the kids. I was just struck by a shift in me emotionally. As soon as I walked into the church, there was no mass on, but there were people sitting in couples and on their own. It was during the day. I just felt immediately safe. It was a very strange feeling. I lit the candle for her and really enjoyed it. And then I made a habit of it. And what became important to that is that at the time, my fourth child, um, Grace, wasn't born. My partner was pregnant with Grace. As those two girls have grown, and I've gone into the church occasionally to light a candle for my grandmother, and they've been with me, I found a way to tell a story about her and introduce her to those two youngest kids. So her instruction, which seemed to be meaningless at the time, took on great significance and, again, has become part of who we are as a family. So that last instruction she gave me, again, the way she stated was sort of, again, quite pragmatic. Well, whenever you feel like it, yeah, don't bother me, I'm going to (laughs) die. It's not my problem. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. But it, it takes on real spiritual and emotional significance. So I think it's remarkable of how she has carried on in our lives. Her presence is really immediate to me. Tony was in his late 40s when his first book was published, almost a decade after Alma died. But hearing him talk about her and her influence on him, it's impossible not to read her presence in his work. Odette Brown, the grandmother at the heart of his novel The White Girl, is the most notable example in a career that's returned again and again to depictions of strong Aboriginal women. Being a child and a grandchild of women like that, you feel loved, you feel utterly protected, but at the same time, there is that hardness to them which comes out of, in a way, the brutality they've had to confront, mostly from men, and because of that, they are really, really tough. I've just finished a new novel which won't come out until November. And I was writing a chapter where two adult sisters are playing music and dancing in a kitchen. One of them gets out an old 78 record, and it's a song called Wheel of Fortune by Kay Starr, who was one of these you know, great singers in the 50s. That was my grandmother's song. Now, what's weird about that is the Wheel of Fortune is about luck. While she didn't ascribe to luck, she would really belt that song out at any opportunity. So it's, you would think that someone who loved that song would be all about luck. But she made her own. Yeah, absolutely. Before we go, I've just finished reading R.F. Quang's Yellow Face, which is a dark satire about the world of publishing. It's about plagiarism and cultural appropriation and manufactured identity. It's a whole lot of fun. It has an unreliable, deeply unself-aware narrator, venal, social media-obsessed, deeply performative publishers. It's a blast. And Sam Drummond's memoir Broke is also a fantastic read. Sam's a Melbourne-based lawyer and disability advocate, and his account of growing up navigating disability and poverty is powerful and moving. It's pretty damning about the many ways in which our system is broken, but ultimately still a joyous read, thanks to Sam's teachers, friends and extraordinary mum. That's it for this week's show. You can find Tony Birch's books and all the others we've talked about today in our show notes. And if you enjoyed the episode, please help us spread the word. Tell your friends and leave a review. It'll really help us a lot. Read This is produced by Clara Ames and edited by Sarah McVie. Mixing and original compositions by Zoltan Fetcher. I'm Michael Williams. Thanks for listening. See you next week.